So IDP is is actually um, is started separately from the Department of Brain Science and Industry, but the goal has been pretty much the same for the last forty seven years or forty six, whatever it is. Is our goal is to to provide technical assistance and education mainly to international buyers of U.S. commodities. Uh, we focus on corn, sorghum, uh, uh, wheat, and corn, sorghum, wheat, uh, soybeans, um, uh, to provide technical assistance so they ended up either buying it in a better way, doing a better job st- uh, storing it, processing, making feed. And, of course, we also touch a little bit there on the animal nutrition and other areas depending on the need. Here from North Carolina State University, this is Adam Farnholz and the Feed Science Podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Carlos Campo-Vidal. He is an outreach specialist and faculty member in the International Grains Program at Kansas State University. How are you doing today, Carlos? Hi, Adam. Uh, I'm doing very well, and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah, happy to have you. So, Carlos uh, will be our, I don't know how many uh, of case aiders we have, and including including me. Um, we, we, we keep having folks from, from K-State either that either uh, went to school there or are, are currently there, which is which is great. Um, certainly uh, something that it's, it's nice to reconnect with everybody. And um, Carlos and I go a, a little ways back. Uh, he was brought on as a program specialist when I guess I would have somewhere in my graduate program there, kind of the early, early 2000s. So we've uh, gotten to, to do some things over the years and it's good to connect again. So Carlos has an interesting, you, you've got an interesting um, opportunity in, in your particular position to work with a lot of different folks kind of around the world uh, on, on feed manufacturing, grain handling, all different kinds of things. Um, because of the of what the international grain program there at, at K State does, but before we get into all that, um, you know your your path originally started there in in Costa Rica and I, with some things with uh, you know family operations. So why don't we go back to where everything started for you and uh, give us your background on on where you came from and how you got to be where you're at now and, and then what you're what you're currently up to. Yeah, great. No, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So well. Uh, I pretty much, uh, I will say, I, I grew up in a, in a, in a very unique uh, position in terms of, uh, I, didn't, I didn't grow up in a farm, but I, I grew up in the city, but all the weekends we went uh, to, to work in our animal, uh, family farm. So it all started uh, with a swine farm. So uh, my, my family is, has uh, been linked for agriculture for, for many years. Uh, my dad was a professor, a consultant in animal nutrition, uh, focusing on very unique in, in dairy and, and monogastric. And that kind of led me kind of like being involved since I was a little kid in, in our swine farm. And also we do have a family um, uh, integrated and of course commercial feed meal. So that's where pretty much all started. I mean, since I was a little kid helping there and then as um, things evolve, I, I actually am a mechanical engineer. So at some point I, I realized, you know, I like the machines, I like the equipment. Let's see what, what, what that brings. And, uh, that turned to another, but anyway, during college, I, I still helped in the farm on the weekends, sometimes during the weekdays, and, and in the feed mill as I got a little bit older, and that kind of set up the path. So, um, finished college in Costa Rica, and and the last year of college, I started working uh, full time. So, uh, as a process engineer, maintenance, also pretty much, you know, being a kind of like. A, Small operation for the U.S. standards, I guess, and mid-size in Costa Rica. We you have to kind of do a little bit of everything. So, drove trucks, quality control, you know, clean whatever it, it, it took during the time. And so, I was there kind of a little bit, like three and a half years. And um, I was always looking into the grad school. So, the the question was always what to do, you know, because um, I always kind of wanted to stay kind of within the line of feed manufacturing, grain storage. And uh, so that led me to to go uh, to the University of Illinois, where, where I ended up doing a master's degree in agriculture engineering. That was what it was called during that time, focusing a little bit more into grain processing. 
and, and green handling. And, and the idea behind that, to be honest, was that my, my I didn't have a, a strong background in terms of everything related to biology, chemistry, being a mechanical engineer. And uh, so I figured this could be the transition to it. And it did, it did, it did work. So uh, after that master's degree, it was always a question of what to do. Um, and so I stay actually doing uh, uh, like eight months, nine months, give or take, doing research for the university, a uh, project for one of the, of the big companies in the related to grain from Illinois. And uh, then afterwards, I, I moved 100 miles <laughs> east to Purdue, Purdue University, where I ended up uh, doing a PhD focusing on, on grain storage to complement the processing side um, in the Department of Agriculture and Biological Engineering. So, and, and during that time, you know, I was working, doing a lot of extension too for the university. And uh, my advisor during the time uh, moved to Kansas State. So a little bit later on, uh, Dr. Dirk Marsh, so he said, hey, you should come here and finish up the, your uh, dissertation here with me. And, and that's how I ended up moving to K-State. So uh, I joined part-time being a program specialist, uh, like you mentioned, uh, in the, was that was uh, 2010, yeah, like around March, April 2010. Yeah, I started working there until the uh, different things set up as a faculty position at IGP Open, and uh, I applied, and that's been, that was 2012, and that's been ever since that I've been there. Um, but the, the fun part, in a way, is that I started, you know, working at, at K-State, and and got excited with all the trainings and all the cool things that we're doing there, like you guys were doing on the feed and, and new things we're doing on storage that I kind of left a little bit of the PhD on the side, but then uh, I had to finish off, you know, <laughs> and that took me a little bit longer than I expected, but uh, it turned out well. And, and a little bit funny on the side there too, is that I, all my committee members were at Purdue except for my advisors. So my economical analysis, uh, we wanted to to get somebody from K-State. And I got a, a very good professor, Dr. Michael Angemar, but he ended up moving to Purdue. So all my committee that I needed to work were, you know, re- remote. And, uh, you know, back, back in those days, we, we, were, we didn't, uh, Zoom was starting and then uh, we also had Adobe Connect and all those things. And so it worked out, but uh, it was kind of funny from that sense. And so being there at UP, uh, full-time faculty since 2012, give or take, and um, all the roles that I do there besides the uh, outreach specialist. Um, I also advise grad students. Uh, I'm grad faculty. Uh, I don't get students all the time. It just depends because my appointment in research is, uh, is we negotiated on a year to year. And uh, so it depends what's going on. Uh, and also I do extension, uh, extension leader for the department, uh, for, from that sense, but there's not too much lately out of it is more, you know, typical extension, answer questions, do documents, things like that. So, so that, that's a little bit of, of my background from that sense. So. Gotcha. Very good. Um, so let's, let's go into a little bit of what are the, uh, especially since we have, you know, based on, on what we're seeing from our, our audience numbers and things, we, we do have a fair amount of international interest in, in you know, seeing what's going on and, and listening to these conversations. So with that particular in mind, can you describe a little bit of what the, the goals and, and overall reasons of being for, for the International Grains Program, for IGP? Absolutely. So so IGP is, is actually um, – is, is started separately from the Department of Grain Science and Industry, but the goal has been pretty much the same for the last 47 years or 46, whatever it is, is our goal is to to provide technical assistance and education, mainly to international buyers of U.S. commodities. Uh, we focus on corn, sorghum, uh, uh, wheat, and corn, sorghum, wheat, uh, soybeans, um, uh, to provide technical assistance so it ended up either buying it in a better way, doing a better job st- uh, storing it, processing, making feed. And of course, we also touch a little bit there on the animal nutrition and other areas, depending on the need. So so IGP, that's the, the, our main goal or mission. But but also at the end of the day, we also do uh, half of our market of participants in our short courses and trainings is, is also domestic. So we also provide that, that we put our, our extension hat there a little bit. It's kind of... Uh, a thin line, what, what does it mean, outreach and extension? But I think we do both. I mean, there's just not too much difference. So uh, IGP, in, in, in essence, what we do is uh, professional development. 
And in, in many ways, uh, with a mission to promote U.S. commodities, but we help this several organizations to uh, create a market access and develop markets for these commodities, either by trainings or by going on site and helping them with different type of projects. So uh, our main thing day to day is organized trainings, either open enrollment that people, anybody from anywhere in the world can sign up or uh, we do tailor made. And that's probably our strongest part. We, we do partner with all the different grain um Export councils from the U.S., the U.S. Soybean Export Council, the U.S. Grain Council that handles corn and sorghum, and Jews with Associates that I'm actually right now working for them on, on a couple of projects uh, like today. <laughs> so that's a little bit of, of, of that. But also we do uh, short courses with uh, for other universities, private companies, even NGOs, give or take. Uh, but besides that, we since we're we're actually – uh, and it varies, but it is almost like a third of our funding comes from the state commissions that produce grain in the state of Kansas and uh, Kansas sorghum, Kansas corn, uh, soybean and, and wheat commissions. And uh, so part of that is also to help these organizations and their missions to promote this grain. So we, we see it a little bit on the marketing, but we do different type of projects that sometimes uh, also include research more, more into the applied thing to help all this um, international companies do a better job and, and create those markets for those grains. So, so in essence, uh, besides trainings, I think we're kind of like more like a professional uh, development, more into the industry level, uh, supporting organization in, in a way. Sure. I, I, would it be fair uh, to say, and, and based on you know what I remember doing with with IGP when when I was there in school and some of the other things that that I do um, that, that we do here at NC State when we're also working with some of those same export councils. A lot of the things that they would come to you as far as wanting to get into markets actually has a lot to do with value add, right? They they will come to somebody like IGP or they will come to somebody like us and they will say hey, we would really like for people in this country to be more interested in buying, let's say, U.S. soy. One of the reasons that we can get them more interested in doing something with U.S. soy is we are going to sponsor educational programs. We're going to help with outreach, even if it's not specifically, you know, I think I think the common thought would be, oh, well, we're, we're promoting this particular commodity. And it's more, I think, in a lot of cases, no, we're promoting that if you will work with this organization, there's a lot of value to you um, because of the different uh, opportunities they can provide and access to things like education. Is that is that a fair way to put that? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, and 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 uh, yes, and of course with with NC State that we have worked to together too. I mean, it's just uh, they they rely a lot on on these organizations with with U.S. institution academic institutions to to do that, and 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 that actually. Um, I have to say, my 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 uh, my father actually worked for the U.S. Soybean Export Council for many years, and it used to be called American Soybean Association, uh, which is still an organization, but more to the domestic uh, government affairs type of deal. But uh, with the way that those organizations go, uh, and the way they do outreach and and help promote those commodities, they bring that value. And I have to say that uh, all this time that I have helped them and and worked with them. Uh, even before my time with K State, I, I noticed that you know that a lot of uh, industries have benefited a lot to, to grow. I mean, uh, companies that were just startups uh, now become you know big companies in their own countries, even uh, go beyond their own um, boundaries to other countries too. So that investment that that the majority of that money, as as some people know, comes from the farmers itself that fund it so uh, through their checkoff program and, and that has a value and uh, there, there's different numbers out there that say that for every dollar that a farmer invests uh, they get X number of dollars back and, and that varies within a range between seven to twenty dollars depending on the commodity and, and the time but but I could say that that support of value added is, is very important and and it does uh, make a difference. Absolutely. I, I absolutely agree. The, um, I think the other really interesting thing, uh, and, and, you know, I, I could do a lot, a, a lot less uh, than you do. And so I'm going to ask you a question of, of, about working with folks from all around, around the world in different capacities, because when I get to do it, it's always interesting to me how, 
how different things are from place to place, right? So when we think about feed manufacturing, it's the Feed Science Podcast. So when we think about feed manufacturing, most folks that are involved in feed manufacturing are very locked into what they're doing, making feed, right? And and because it is an all day, every day kind of in, engaged thing, you kind of get into this mindset of, well, the way that I'm making feed is the way that feed is made, right? So what would you say are some of the interesting things when you get to work, whether it be travel or when people are coming to, to IGP, when you get to work with these folks from different parts of the world, what are the interesting things that come up about just how different feed manufacturing can be from, you know, major giant integrators here in the U S to, you know, very um, precise manufacturing that's done in, in maybe some small batch things in Europe to third world. That's just trying to get to be able to make their own feed. What are some of the interesting things that you see that are differences amongst the, the kind of the global feed footprint? Oh yeah, no, no. And I agree with you. It's, it's, it's also for me very interesting, despite the fact that I've been doing there for, for several years now, but it, it's always something different, especially with the country. And, and some of those things are also even countries that are next to each other. They might do it even between them, different, several things. But um, there's always one, one thing that always uh, has, uh, it's always kind of different in a, in a way from how we do things in the U.S. is that uh, the markets are, are a little bit different in, in a way, uh, and, and I'll put it in different perspectives too. In, in the U.S., you know, we, we do a lot of uh, just uh, corn and soybean diets. You know, at the end of the day, the two main ingredients, the U.S., one of the top producers in both uh, commodities. Uh, but in other places, they use all those different type of ingredients that um, that sometimes is just a little bit different how you handle uh, how you purchase them, you know, their, their availability, and, and of course, all the different uh, nutritional composition to it. So that also triggers from the feed perspective, different ways on how to handle making all those batches and the overall quality for, for somebody, like, for example, making pellets, you know, you just have to count more valuables if you're thinking about how that in specific feed ingredients affect the quality besides the operation and other things into it. But it, that that's one of those. There are all this variety of things how, how we're done. Also, in, in, in a way, you know, uh, there's different interesting things on, on some markets, how they're in a way, uh, in the U.S. is very competitive, but there's less players now these days, especially with the big integrators. But in other countries, there's there's companies that are both commercial, integrated, but they have to fight a market that is very limited at the end of the day because, you know, smaller markets. And, and that has a different perspective on how they do things specifically with logistics, with uh, transportation and, you know, things like that. And then, of course, also on the quality. Uh, quality in in some cases there's countries that put a lot of focus on quality for example in, in peloton quality that maybe other parts of the world don't, don't do that much uh, because they're looking more into volume instead of just overall quality and that go back a lot because of, of how you fight the market you know so so that's something very very interesting um of course equipment wise you see some things that depending i always call it that you know i'm more used to you know growing up and then working in the U.S. with American equipment. But then, of course, you get some of the big European, they do more, um, you know, um, post-mixing uh, grinding or, you know, post-grinding type of deals. They use more pre-grinding. So some of that perspective. And and one thing that, that has pushed a lot and all these expert councils uh, understand it and they're working on it is that uh, there is a big wave of sustainability, too. Uh, a lot of those feed companies are looking into it and now more in going into what, what is called a circular economy, which is very difficult in the fit industry because there's just not too much co-products that you can incorporate for other things and, and, and how to circulate all those different uh, resources back into the production. But uh, we see that uh, certifications of sustainability, uh, the agriculture industry is very big on that. And, and that's something very focused. The, the other thing kind of like that also moving a little bit besides on the, on the pet food, for example, um, you know, in the, in the U.S., pet food is, is really very high quality. And, and there are different type of brands and, and qualities and things like that. But around the world, you kind of see that there's always this really economic uh, type of pet food, more for, for rural side and with, you know, 
more typical, assimilated to, let's say, a monogastric uh, diet that we do in the U.S., and then you get into that uh, premium and then super premium levels that is more what you see in the U.S. in terms of quality and how fast that is growing. So that that always see how people are catching up into that worldwide. So that that's something also that, that calls my attention uh, for the last couple of years. For sure. Yeah, we, we talk about it um, in, in a lot of different contexts, but we we when we're bringing, let's say, students in undergrads and they're just coming in and they're learning about the um, nutrition production, animal production, and then certainly on the animal food production side of, of things. We talk about that a lot when it comes to developing countries. Um, and, you know, the first things we see when folks start getting a little bit more disposable income is they want more meat, which is going to be more food animal production, and they want pets. You know, and if, if, you, if you're having a hard time, you know, getting food for yourself, you're, you're not going to have pets to, to feed as well. But as soon as um, you know, that becomes a little more stable. We then all of a sudden see pets become a thing. And once pets become a thing, pet food becomes a thing. And then um, that's a that's a whole different way of looking at things. Uh, something else I was going to ask you about kind of in that, and you kind of alluded to it a little bit. When you, you have any interesting thoughts or, or stories or anything like that on when people maybe come to do training or to learn or, or brought in for whatever reason, Things that when they get here and they learn about the U.S. feed manufacturing uh, operations, you know, when, when you take them out and go into feed mills or they see different kinds of programs, quality, are there things that you find that they're surprised that we don't do that they think, wow, the U.S. feed industry is, you know, big and great. And it's got all of these, you know, it, it's at the top of the line. But wait a minute, what do you what do you mean you don't do that? Anything come to mind there? Well, uh, one that that in a, in a way is is sometimes surprising, and not everybody, but for for some countries, probably with a higher level of production and, and professionalism, let's say, uh, they they always surprise uh, in terms of of cleanliness. You know, I, I I joke, but you know, sometimes we take into our own K State feed mail or or some of outside the commercial side and. Some countries, uh, some people are from some countries are saying like, wow, this is very clean. And some is like, wow, this is very dirty. And but of course, you know, w- when you're in a developing country that, you know, with with all due respect, that the, the cost of labor is cheaper. You know, you have more people that could do that in the U.S. You know, in reality, that that's something that we tend to go more into the automation to, because the cost of labor, lack of of personnel with skill sets to go into come into the industry and and I know that you have done a lot of good presentations and work on that and and it is something that has happened in the US especially the last couple of years so that, that's something that I always kind of uh, that people say hey why, why, why you guys don't do that and then and then up to a point also uh, some parts of the country especially in the developing world you see a lot of people really focusing on how to save energy. And, and in the U.S., we do, too, but the, the cost of, uh, of electricity overall is cheaper compared to the majority of places, uh, unless it is an oil production you know, country. But, uh, you know, how, how those resources are not really detailed. And, and yes, if in the U.S. we do it, you know, it might take a little bit more. Doing that might be more costly than actually just let it go. But, but it, it does happen. And, and that always, at the end of the day, always, always surprised me how some people are really particular from that sense and and that sometimes even affect their own production because the the cost of ener- energy or the times they could produce because the, the cost of electricity is cheaper like let's say uh early in the in the morning or in the evening that affects many of the overall ways how production and administration all interact because they might not all be at the same time so that that's something that that, that it is uh very surprising, and, and I will add so another that it, it, it's that the way that you know in the in the U.S. everything is very well organized in a way, fairly automated. In other countries, they have to work twenty four hours, you know, and and just keep going. Even that in the commercial feed mill in the U.S. also, but then you start expanding, and and that that uh, that happens. But in the other parts of the world, not necessarily. That that is the case. So that's always the 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 that will twenty four seven. That's a lot of people do around the world. Always surprise me too. So 
Absolutely. But again, my guest today is Dr. Carlos Campo Vidal. Uh, he is an outreach specialist and faculty member in the International Grains Program at Kansas State University. So I, I kind of keeping on that international international side of things and in its comparison, I think another thing I find very interesting, and again, you, you just you just touched on a little bit there, um, maybe talk a little bit more about it, is the people that will come in. And certainly on the, the labor side, there's a there's a difference potentially in skilled and unskilled labor. Although in the U.S. we're having some of the same issues now. Uh, go find a go find a good maintenance person, and if you do, you better hold on to them because they're getting harder and harder to, to come by. And that's a little more akin to what we see in um, other parts of the world where there's not so many people with those that type of training. But I also find it very interesting that most of the time when we see somebody uh, come in for for trainings and things like that. Uh, we're usually talking to mill managers, operators, maintenance personnel, that sort of thing. And, and a lot of times when we see those international visitors and we say, well, what is, you know, is this a mill manager? What is it? And they're like, oh, no, this is the person that owns five of these feed mills or something. And you go, oh, OK, it's a little it's a, it's a little different. And, and so I, I wonder what um, maybe those interesting interactions might be there, too, when you're actually talking with people. Um, getting more opportunity, I think, in a lot of cases. And I mean, it would be true here, too, if we were if somebody was going to go travel to the other side of the world, it's more likely to be the owner or the CEO or something like that. than it's going to be, you know, the, the shift operator of some sort. So it makes a certain amount of sense. But how do those interactions differ when you're, let's say, doing courses or trainings and you've got folks in the room that are, you know, operator or, or supervisor type level versus, okay, the, the four people in this room are responsible for 30% of the feed production in their country and they, they're the ones that own it. What is, is, does that create some different conversations? Yeah, no, no. And, and you bring a, a very good point into it because, uh, you know, I, I always compare it when I do the domestic trainings, you know, you get meal, like you said, meal managers operate in maintenance and, and others. But uh, sometimes it's very surprising when, when you get all these uh, owners of very big companies around the world. Ben. But it, it, the conversation, yeah, it, it does change it. I uh, and, and I'll see it both ways, you know, because what, when you get these people uh, that are owned the companies or a CEO or something like that, they go there, maybe not necessarily just to know all the details of the technical news uh, uh, things that we're trying to train them on. But they go in and they see different things as they walk through the mill, as they interact with all the different uh, uh, trainers or instructors, professors, and they might get a new idea for their own business or how they can improve it because they see it more as a whole global uh, company. Uh, when when we work with the operation guys, like you said a little bit earlier in this in this in this uh, podcast, is that you know. Female, you just focus on making feed that day and that's it. And that's usually more into the technical side that it's very detailed. But maybe this owner, CEO, uh, they will see it as a, as a whole, you know, and, and uh, include all the different areas. So uh, in some cases, I have done uh, feed manufacturing courses that we ended up talking more about U.S. grain grading or, or contracts, you know, and, or logistics, because that also impacts for them, you know, and especially that around the world, they buy a lot of their commodities from the U.S. So and they, they when they come to Kansas State or NC State or any other university, you just walk out and, and they're grown there. So they want to learn more all about that. So conversation does, does shift and, and they like to see a lot of uh, big numbers, uh, financial implications. And, and one thing is also indicators. How can they improve their performance? So that's what we have to really balance off instead of just going very technical, for example, how, you know, you work with some specs on a pellet mill or a hammer mill, more overall how you, you manage a feed mill, how you look at different things like maintenance and operations and safety from a whole uh, perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's one of the interesting things from the from the training perspective overall is that depending on on who is there, it really gives, you know, a, a, a really good picture of just all the different things that have to go on. Like you just said, like some people were training on the regulatory aspect and others are being trained on safety and others are being trained on just making feet and others on actually maintaining the equipment. And when you kind of live it every day, whether it be teaching it or out in the, you know, out in the world doing education or consulting or, or 
being someone in the female making feed, you, you live it every day and it's kind of, yeah, it's all one big box and everything goes on. But when you think about all the different aspects that are going on inside that feed mill, it's, uh, it's a little overwhelming when you start actually parsing it out. Um, so before we uh, kind of get kind of wrap up here, you know, very similar um, you know, to, to what we do here at NC state, you know, we've got our, um, every fall we do our production school that we do with Carolina feed industry association. And, and we allow folks to come in and do, um, and, and sit through trainings. We've got a few different, uh, programs within a, a one week that we, that we do. It's usually in October, November, every year, obviously IGP, as you said, you guys have, um, you, you guys will do, individualized courses if, if somebody specifically wants one for themselves, but you also have some public courses that folks can, um, can enroll in. Uh, do you want to maybe mention to that um, so that folks kind of know what those opportunities might be, the, the different things on the feed and the handling and the management side that you guys do? Sure, sure. Absolutely. So, um, so in my, in my program that I, that I manage, that is the green store feed and feed manufacturing that also, covers animal nutrition and pet food, you know, we, we have a, a variety of open enrollment courses more to the public, like I mentioned. We, I have a, on the grain storage, a grain elevator managers course uh, that we do at least once or twice a year. And that's very focused just on the domestic market, despite the fact that there's sometimes internationals that, that want to attend, but we focus on how, how grain is moved between the, the companies in the U.S. And, and that's a different perspective. Um, from that same uh, program on the storage and handling, we do have a hands-on training course that it's um, – very interesting because we actually is this is for operators and uh, maintenance people where we do a two and a half day course on just hands-on training on handling equipment conveyors screw conveyors uh, buck elevators and and people from the feed industry come mainly also grain elevators sometimes in flour mills and other uh, grain processing uh, uh, industries uh, we're also expanding Hopefully for, for next year, this year I can pull it off, uh, but it's also kind of like a grain storage course focused for international buyers. So that'll be more for the international audience, more focus on tropical weather conditions for storage, which is different to what we do in the U.S. in, in a way. I mean, some things are similar, some are different, of course. Um, on the feed manufacturing, we do a lot of for the domestic market, the regulatory uh uh, PCQI trainings uh, with the National Grain and Feed Association. We do uh, three of those a year. Uh, we have our, like same as you guys, uh, are in, uh, either late June, uh, late June is usually when we do it, uh, open enrollment, IDP overall feed manufacturing course, which is just a general course of feed manufacturing. I'll aim it as a mid-level. Uh, we try to cover as much from receiving all the way to dispatch loading of, of feed. Uh, all the process and, and also handle a little bit of storage, of course, quality control, other things, hands-on uh, activities there for quality in our, in our feed mill and demos. Um, we do have on the uh, extrusion side, we have a very big, as you know, uh, extrusion that is led by a, a, a colleague, Dr. Sajid Alavi. He does have his annual extrusion course that is happening uh, within two weeks from now, always kind of like mid-August. Uh, overall, from extrusion, uh, they, they focus a lot on pet food agriculture, but they also cover a little bit of how to make some products on the human side. So it's everything from the technology operations of extrusion. Uh, we do have several pet food courses. We have a pet food formulation uh, that's usually around January. Then we do have a pet food processing that varies a little bit of the time. And, and that's kind of get changing as, as we need a new person uh, helping to teach that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, how to commercialize pet food. And, and that's open enrollment, too, uh, from, from that side. Uh, that's pretty much what I can remember, at least from my curriculum here uh, off the bat. But uh, we also have two more curriculums, like uh, the Grain Procurement Risk Management, led by Guy Allen, and uh, everything from, from how to price discovery, marketing of grain, reduce risk, all those type of things, and transportation logistics. And then our grain processing, more milling, focus mainly on wheat, but also could be a little bit on corn for products that are going to go for the human consumption led by Sean Thiele too. So those we have also plenty of courses in open enrollment 
to from basic level to advanced level. So, so many of those things that, that we're doing, we also offer some courses uh, online with different industry partners, trade associations, a uh, hybrid model that we call that with or blended that you uh, take some online courses on your own time or live, and then you come on to more advanced level there at, at IGP or, or even offsite if, if needed. So different type of things that we're doing kind of like a, uh, right now, um, we're trying to expand. Uh, we have expanded, actually, not trying on the baking side, and that's not on the feed side, but it's important to know that we complemented that and and uh, looking into other things that could help improve on the on the feed side with more animal nutrition focused uh, courses. Sure, excellent. Well, the whole you know the whole purpose of this uh, this podcast getting put out there was to you know, give people an insight on what's going on, what's going on in the feed industry, but also, you know, provide a little bit of education or in this case, you know, access to knowing what those opportunities might be. And I think it's, I think it's great that people know that, you know, at various different institutions and for various different skill sets and for various different parts of the industry, that there is probably something that uh, amongst the group of us that kind of focus in this, in this space, that there is probably something out there that if you you know want a little bit of continuing education or further education on something that that we're we're here to be able to do that and there's lots of good opportunities there at igp to, to take advantage of it's time for our famous three okay so we're gonna finish finish up here we always ask um all of our guests a few questions at the end kind of in that same idea of, of giving people, you know, something to think about or potentially something to, to go look into. So the first question uh, always is, do you have a particular resource that you would recommend to folks um, related to the, the feed industry or feed science um, that you have found particularly valuable? It could be a book or a periodical or, you know, a, a, a newsletter you get in your email box every week or so or a website you really like. Um, that you kind of think, hey, everybody should probably have this in their toolbox in, in order to, to be well-informed or to educate themselves? Uh, well, you know, of course, uh, the Fit Technology book of AFIA, you know, it's uh, with, with the new uh, version 5 or the new version 6, it, it's always a great tool. I mean, it's just, it's just a compilation of, of great technical guidelines and, and information into it. Um, I also uh, temp, uh, tap into... Uh, uh, a lot of the extension publications that, that you guys and NC State do, uh, Kansas State, I think there's all our resources. Of course, for international folks, keep in mind that those are made mainly for the domestic market, but they also apply in many, many, many cases. Um, that, that usually is uh, kind of like uh, uh, go into it. Sometimes I, of course, uh, when I'm trying to think a little bit more into the scientific, I try to hit a little bit of the journals, the animal science, and, and then the area of the feed size there too. Uh, the European, some universities also have a lot of uh, publications out there that are also very helpful. Uh, in Norway, I use one specifically for aquaculture because uh, we have done a lot of aquaculture for the last couple of years and, and involved in several market developing pro uh, projects on that. So I think that will be pretty much, there's also several blocks out there. Angor Mix is one that um, I, I participate now and then, and there's also sometimes good information. Uh, you just have to keep an eye that uh, look for reference, you know, because a lot of people tell opinions but not be totally 100% accurate at the point or not, not applicable. And they do it in English, Spanish, and, and in Portuguese for the Brazilian market too. So I, I guess those are pretty much the, the main, but I also sometimes go and ask different people, you know. Uh, it's always good to have that uh, expert from specific areas that like the equipment manufacturers too also are very, very helpful from that. So Absolutely. Okay, so on the not necessarily attached to our industry, um, anything, uh, you know, a, a really good book you've read or, or something else that you, you find particularly valuable from a management perspective or a leadership or staying informed on world events or anything like that, that you, you would, you know, if someone said, hey, if I, I had some time to, to go read something, this would, this would be something you would recommend. Well, you know, uh, s several things, you know, uh, the, there's a book and it's kind of case, escapes me the name, but it's on key performance indicators uh, overall that it was actually uh, recommended by Dr. Charles Stark and and that both of us know very well. Uh, I like that because you could uh, it's overall a general book on key performance indicators for many in this type of industries. 
But then you could think a little bit of, of your own uh, industry, feed, animal production, nutrition, whatever the case is. I, I that's that's one. It just cased me, and I'll be in my office. I just like turn and pull the book out. But <laughs> that that's something that that I, that I like to 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 use as a reference every now and then. Um, then also, I I always follow different uh, magazines that send you uh, newsletters uh, for different industries. You know, there's uh, World Grain is one that I really enjoyed uh, because they they have a, they put a very international uh, perspective. And also focus on very detail on the U.S. market too. Uh, from from that um, from that perspective, then I also follow a little bit of some of the agriculture ones and pet food industry. Also, it's a magazine that also sends you newsletters, things like that. In essence, that's usually the the ones I I, I get a lot of them. I sometimes don't don't go in detail on them, but one that I also use as a resource is also feed stuff. That that is, I think is also. And and uh, and I have memories of that uh, being a, a kid. My dad reading pit stuff, you know, it was kind of funny. But uh, you know, I still do. And and those are also very very good resources. Uh, Grain Journal magazine online or, or or printed version also is a very good resource. Especially they put a lot of focus on safety. So those are all. There. I know I went back to to the technical side of things, and I apologize, but but I think I kind of tricked my. my I, came up in my mind as we were uh, speaking on, on it. So, yeah. yeah. No, that's, uh, that, that, that's pretty common. That, that's, what, that's what a lot of folks do. And, oh, you know, here's another one. Because obviously we, we, we kind of live it and that's what we spend most of our time reading or engaging with, right? And so that's, no, that's perfect. Um, so the last question would be uh, for those folks who are out there who are always trying to, you know, professional development, get better at what they do. You've gotten to interact with a lot of folks from a lot of different industries, organizations, different countries, different regions. If you could pick a, a trait or two that you see in the most successful professionals um, that, that really makes them stand out and has made them successful in their chosen career path, what would you maybe identify that would be? Like a specific uh, area? Uh, yeah, not not necessarily a specific area of expertise, but a specific more like character trait. Um, we've had people talk about dedication, and we've had people talk about you know people being particularly organized. If, if, is there anything that stands out from all these people when you say, "Yeah, I can"? That person's very successful in their business. That person's very successful in their industry, and I can see that these people have this in common as far as the way they they handle themselves. Well, you know, uh, I'll answer it in a couple ways because they they might not overlap very well. But um, one thing that that uh, for me is always kind of growing up in the feed industry and how I see it now, and even that in my family we we make pet food, but more to that economic uh, level type is the pet food industry. You know, because they they overlap with how. Uh, you know, now it's animal food, but with a human food type of deal, you know, the way they handle things is a different perspective than traditionally how feed is made or animal food is made right now for the other different type of uh, livestock. And they always see it more, uh, you know, I, I always think that in the animal industry, we were making food, you know, but uh, it's a little bit different perspective. I see it more like a pet food. It's, it's more like a business, you know, not making that much of a food, being that context. So that's something that I always kind of is a different way that they handle, which is important because they bring different type of skills, especially on the marketing. They, they rely a lot of marketing and how to call the attention of the owner of that pet to buy that from a um, how it looks to a nutritional perspective or, or results, something like that. Um, if I, other way to answer that, um, so, some some countries that have a specific ways of of handling the industry, uh, it's always a little bit of surprise me. And I will put, for example, uh, the feed industry in Colombia. I mean, the, the, the is very well developed, very professional, and they run it like like an industry, like somebody that runs a feed mill company could have been running, uh, uh, could be in the oil industry before, and then moved to the car manufacturing. 
they just have that mindset of production, very professionalized and very, very organized. In fact, the, the feed industry there is under the all national industry association. So we're not separated into the, they're not separated as the ag sector usually is looking into it. So that's an example of it that I always like kind of admire and follow a lot of the things that they, that they do. They still come to training to the U.S. for the feed technical side of things, but I believe that they have that. And, and that's something very, very interesting, you know. Um, I think also of the in the European sector, they, they focus a lot on regulatory, but they always try to make it uh, more, uh, and, and that's very European in a way, uh, how they handle everything, look into for the environment and to feed the needs of the of the community, which is not, I'm not saying the rest of industries don't do it, but uh, countries don't do it, but it just kind of, in a way, it's very important to look what they do in a way that uh, adapts to the situations that we have in our own country. So that's something probably that, that I will, that I will, that I will, that will, that will calls my attention. Gotcha. Very good. Well, it's been a great conversation. It was good to, it was good to catch up. Uh, once again, my guest today has been Dr. Carlos Campo Vidal from Kansas State University and the International Grains Program. Thanks a lot, Carlos. We appreciate your time. No, thank you very much for the opportunity. From North Carolina State University, I'm Adam Farinholtz, and this has been the Feed Science Podcast.